Okay, home prices are falling faster now than in 2006. We're talking the last housing crash and crisis. So welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Randy Patrick here putting the realism back in real estate. Today is the 1st of November. Can you believe it? There are two more months left in the year and we're all done. We're going to be in 2023. So time flies and you're having fun. This has certainly been the year of change with respect to real estate. Very interesting stuff going on these days. Can't keep up. Listen, I could write, I could do two videos a day with all the news and stuff that's going on. Be a little bit overkill. I get it too. But anyway, there's that much stuff happening. But first of all, if you want to take a look at my new report, it's called From Bubble to Correction, Then Crash to Crisis, How the Housing Market Imploded in Six Months. Just email me at that email and I'll send you a uh, PDF copy right away. All right. Thanks very much. Okay, so this guy is the CEO of Redfin, and you know he's ob obviously quoted quite a bit in the news media. So he basically said home prices are falling faster now than 2006, and he revealed why. Well, we probably know why, but he's going to talk about it. Um, essentially, you know, I guess how could I put it in, in concise terms? It's investment. It's investors. Okay, so ultimately, what happened after the last housing crisis is that a lot of investors, a lot of money primarily hedge funds, real estate investment trusts, other people that have a huge amount of funds, realize that the single family residential home, the SFR, is a great asset class they could make decent money from. And that's kind of where it started. So you have Blackstone, you have people who are buying all these properties, other hedge funds, you've got people who are average Joes, they say, pouring into the market, looking for Airbnb opportunities. You've got eye buyers like Open Door, Zillow, OfferPad, all these other ones coming through the, the ranks basically stoking the markets, overperforming, overbuying in order to grab market share, they certainly pushed it up. So fast forward to October, that investor mania has been replaced by investor panic. So the ongoing housing correction, uh, uh, home prices have fallen 1.6% between June and August, has scared many investors to the sidelines. That, that marks the first national home price decline since 2012. So that's back in, in the um, <clears throat> summertime. We know that that's actually picking up the pace right now, the, the decline. So essentially, uh, investor pullback makes sense. While most housing economists don't foresee a correction on scale with the great financial crisis of 2008, uh, which home prices fell, fell 27%, uh, they do acknowledge that this home price correction is sharper than it was in 2006. So this is the thing which always confuses me. You know, I, As I said before, people don't like to call things out and be wrong. It's you know, it's corporate suicide, it's social suicide, whatever you want to call it. Um, they don't want to be the one to, to, to be wrong. And I get it. I mean, I understand how people want to be correct and want to be in, in their perspective and their lane. But in this case, you know, 27% across the board is what we lost the last U.S. housing correction. But we've got other ratings companies, other financial companies who are saying some markets could be at least 25 or 30% depending on how things play out. So again, <clears throat> you know, realize that when people are talking about this, so this guy who is the CEO, he's not going to come out and say, all hex break and loose and look out because guess what? Um, they have investors and they're publicly traded and they would send, that would send, send their stock market or stock prices crashing. They don't want to do that. Their market cap is too important. So, but you know, the housing and also the pandemic housing booms investor frenzy helps explain why home prices are correcting faster this time around. So sellers simply don't want to relent on price unless economics, like a supply gut, force their hand. Um, that's not much the case for institutional investors and builders. If they think prices are about to drop, they want to get out first. So that's exactly what I always said. You see that the investor market, the feet in the street, sees the market, reacts to the market first. They see it coming a mile down the road and they don't wait they don't have emotional attachment. It's all about numbers. So if they think things are going to start to fall down, they start selling. They start marking down now. As they said, they want to get out and liquidate while they're getting out is good. Uh, the fact that the pandemic housing boom saw investors become a higher share of buyers ultimately makes the U.S. housing market more vulnerable to a faster swing down, which, listen, I do uh, agree with that. That's always making sense, right? Now, as he says, when the shiitake mushrooms hit the fan, investors want to get out first. The way you do that is figure out where the lowest sale is and be 2% below that. If it doesn't sell on the first weekend, move it down again. So basically, you know, what you know what he's suggesting is that all these iBuyers and these investment companies help drive up the prices 
and to push it up in the boom, and they're also going to push prices downward in the correction. Um, you know, again, I buyers, builders, investors account for more industry, more inventory than they used to have back in the day. That leads to a faster correction. Simple as is that. So uh, again, do we want to blame it on the investment market? Sure, why not? All right. But here's the thing: if you take a look at the change between Q1 2020 2021 and Q1 2022, you can see the amount of percentage of homes bought by investors was pretty significant in many of the larger metro markets across the U.S. Now realize, you know, what ha what you know what happened in Q1 22? Nothing, right? We still had low interest rates. Once the second quarter came, interest rates came up. So you can see that for the Q1 2021 to Q1 2022 this year, look at the, the opportunities. Atlanta, almost 33%, um, <clears throat> you know, they bought Charlotte, Jacksonville, Phoenix, Nashville, Columbus, Orlando, Tampa, Las Vegas, Sacramento, San Diego, Baltimore, New York, Miami, Detroit, LA. So the list goes on and on and on. <clears throat> the only locations that actually seem to pull back uh, were Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Seattle. And uh, there could be reasons locally that didn't make sense to do that. Or, or like I know Seattle all obviously peaked quite a while ago, so who knows what goes on there. But my point is that you know, you know, with these low interest rates and the frenzy going on, the opportunity to buy and resell or to buy and put renters in was increasing. So in many of the locations across the country, you've seen significant um, number of, of homes bought by investors, right? And again, investors could be hedge funds, could be real estate investment trusts, could be, um, you know, those large investors with lots of money, could be ma and pa investors, the, the Joe Average investor. So he's saying, let's be clear, investor mania didn't send U.S. home prices up 43% during the pandemic housing boom. It was a perfect storm. Ability to work from anywhere, saw white collar professionals both pony up for larger properties and take off for far flung mar far flung markets like Boise, and historically low mortgage rates, which bottomed out at 2.65% in Jan 2021, made mortgage payments more affordable even as prices rose. So yeah, the whole idea is that as prices rose, you know the the quantitative easing was still going on, so you could still purchase a home. You still had some pretty good mortgage products out there. You could still FHA with lower lower criteria on credit score, debt to income ratio, and low down payments. So people were able to get in. Uh, you know, not to mention this all occurred amid a period of low inventory and favorable first time millennial home buyer demographics. So again, low interest rates, uh, lower inventory, more competition, people relocating, looking for more property or different property. I know that there's probably people who bought in other locations as the backup plan, you know, to, to take off when they didn't like what was happening in their own city and stuff like that. So you probably saw that we saw an increase an activity which drove prices up pretty much everywhere across the country. And guess what? Now now things will change. So he attributes uh, the swiftness of home price correction, which is kind of obvious, to mortgage rates uh, that rose for investors and builders. Um, U.S. housing market has become much more mortgage rate sensitive in the years following 2008 housing crash, which I agree. So we all talk about you know the affordability um, you know, issues, right? Everything is unaffordable. So, the, you know, when rates move up you know, 25 basis points, 50 basis points, even more, it, it makes an, a big dent in the monthly payment for the average you know, buyer, essentially. So clearly you want to hit it at the right time. Um, <clears throat> also, he said, second, the housing crash previously in 2008 taught sellers and buyers alike that home prices can indeed fall. So we've pretty much, before the 2008 housing crash, we've pretty much seen a linear trajectory of annual home price appreciation as far as we can remember, right? So once the 2008 crash came into play, we saw it go very high and drop down dramatically, and therefore we got a taste of what that cycle was. So therefore right now, people are in that situation where, hey, we know it's too high, we're talking about it being too high, we're in a bubble, it's affordability crisis the whole bit, I'm gonna wait it out. So if you're going to wait it out, what's going to happen eventually, you know, sellers are going to have to, if they need to sell or want to sell, they're going to have to adjust and thus push price points down starting on the correction side of things, right? So again, um, how can I put it? Um, folks now respond to the 2008 correction with almost PTSD. So they pull back more quickly. Uh, as I mentioned, there are people that I know and people that I hear in my comments, stuff like that, that they say, I'm not going to buy a property till I see a material drop in price points, 30%, 50%, whatever. So again, what, will those values happen? Well, they could happen. We know that Moody's uh, talks about you know, 25, 30% some of the overvalued markets. Think about it though, if your overvalued market's up 60% and you're losing 30%, 
you're still net higher, but at least it's more palatable than than it was, you know, six months ago, etc. So you got to keep all these things in mind. It's very interesting to see how things are playing out. Point being, though, is that you know we now have come to, from point A, which is double digit appreciation earlier in the year. Everything's great. Go buy that house, or if you don't buy it, you're going to miss out. To now, people going, uh, uh, I ain't gonna buy. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna watch this thing crash. Then I might jump on board. Clearly, that's a bit of, as it said, the PTSD of the last housing crash. I think it's PTSD of the ridiculous price points and bidding wars and things like that. Because remember, um, there's often all these articles that come out and they talk about how people say that buying a house is their most stressful experience they're ever gonna, they ever, you know, have or they've. They've ever you know dealt with in their whole entire life, which shouldn't be the case. You're just buying a house, right? Come on. So, oh, by the way, folks, if you're not a subscriber to my channel and you appreciate the information I provide, if you could hit that subscribe button, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, moving on here, guys. Um, <clears throat> again, why do I like Moody's? Well, you know what? Um, it came out of nowhere that you know, as I said, we've got three groups. You've got um, Moody's. Uh, you know, obviously Moody's Analytics, you got Fitch Ratings, and you got Goldman Sachs, and all of them have come out this fall. You know, obviously they saw what happened, you know, the spring, the underwhelming spring selling season, and they've come out this fall basically saying, ooh, we're going to have some, you know, home value, you know, depreciation, declines in home home price home prices. So that's great. Well, Moody's is the one that's come out, I guess you could say the boldest, the strongest, saying, hey, this is what's going on. You know, we expect this at a minimum this at a maximum, and we still don't know what could really happen, which is cool. So ultimately, Moody's home prices home prices to crash 20% in Nashville. Here's the revised forecast for the nation's 322 largest housing markets. So this week, we learned that uh, slumped home construction subtracted 1.37 percentage points from the U.S. GDP in the third quarter. That's the biggest housing contraction since 2007. I want to make a point about this here because realize that the real estate slash housing sector contributes hugely to the GDP. So when stuff like this happens, it's noticeable and it makes a big difference out there, okay? And this is just home construction, let alone real estate sales, you know, materials, you know, you know mortgages, title, closing, escrow, all the all the things that go into home home transferring or, or buying and selling homes. Think about the things, movers, moving expenses, you buy stuff for your house, like furniture, like it list goes on and on, all right? So uh, it does affect the GDP. Uh, that's the I said, biggest housing contraction since 2007. So we're kind of right in what happened the last housing crisis. We're right, like what we experienced back 2006, 7 we're kind of doing it right now, okay? Mortgage purchase applications are down almost 42% year over year. Total mortgage purchase applications are now lower than any point um, hit uh, during um, <clears throat> the Great Recession. So basically, no one's thinking about buying a house right now. So if you're listing your house for sale, and it's overvalued, you're not going to get any offers, and people aren't running down, knocking on the doors of mortgage bankers, brokers, and lenders to say, hey, you know, finance me, please, with these high interest rates, which we expect will rise, right? So the downshift in housing activity sharpened in a few weeks. Uh, mortgage rate surge on Friday, the average mortgage rate for 30-year fix was 7.08%. Uh, had not seen a seven-handle mortgage rate since 2002. So it's been about 20 years since we've seen mortgage rates this high. So you combine that with intensified housing market turndown, with mortgage rates, with other issues, with inflation, things like that. So basically, Moody's now predicts U.S. home prices will fall 10% from peak to trough. They're saying that with respect to generically across the board. That was usually about 5%. Now they're going 10%, but it actually gets better as we, as we look into this here. And, and again, realize that Moody's, and anybody else, Fitch Ratings, Goldman Sachs, and as I said, they're not going to call chaos, right? No one's calling chaos, but what they're doing is they're actually priming us to be ready for what's going to happen. So my perspective is if you don't know what's going on, figure that out pretty quick and get prepared for it. We're already doing stuff on our end. We've got tons of tons of stuff we're, we're doing right now. My short sale business is picking up the whole bit. We see the market changing every day, which is cool. So, so what Moody's did is they revised the original forecast, all right? And I'll expand this map in the next slide here, but it says, in total, Moody's Analytics analyzed 322 regional housing markets. Of those, the firm predicts 100% will see peak to trough home price declines. So out of the 322 top markets, they predict every single one of those markets will lose value. Uh, on a going forward basis, which I think is interesting. So it's no longer, you know, 25% or 50% of the markets. It's 
every one of the markets they look at will lose some sort of value. So this is a little bit of a bigger map here. All right, let's take a look at it. Obviously, the darker sort of blue, purpley, um, you know, you know, purpley, darker purple. Um, I don't know what that's called, indigo. I don't know. Uh, again, I'm half colorblind anyway. But the point is that you can see that the darker is sort of, you know, coming up in some of the marketplaces um, that we're looking at 10% to 25% loss here. Uh, this is now. Now, one thing I do appreciate about Moody's is that they're not being static. They're actually revising this every couple of weeks, which is quite interesting. So as I said, I do, you know, I do appreciate what they're doing. They seem to be the ones leading the discussion points on the housing market going the other way. All right. Not the rah, rah, everything's great. Don't worry about it. They're actually saying, Ooh, better better be aware, better see what's happening here. That we're going to show you the markets that are going to be affected. So you can see some of those locations. I can look at Florida, I can see Naples, I can see what looks like some some stuff in South Carolina, probably Charleston and Myrtle Beach area. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else I can see. Probably parts in Texas. Probably that's Austin. Um, we got some dark stuff going purpley going over on Nevada area. Some areas in the Los Angeles area. Obviously the Northwest. Uh, upper Northwest areas, big time. So again, stuff happening, um, you know, all over the the U.S. It seems like not, you know, a market's not going to be, um, you know, uh, hiding from this stuff. Uh, how much home prices are expected to fall according to Moody's revised forecast? These 25 markets are expected to see the biggest peak to trough home price declines. Morristown, Tennessee, Mus Muskegon. I used to be able to say this. Muskegon, Michigan. Um, Boise, Idaho, Flagstaff, Arizona, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Nashville, uh, uh, I don't know how to say that word in Hawaii, Lake Havasu, Arizona, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Naples, Crestview, Florida, Bend, Oregon, Cleveland, Tennessee, Clarksville, Tennessee, Racine, Wisconsin, Idaho Falls, in, you know, Idaho, Austin, Texas, Charleston, Albany, Oregon, Phoenix, Knoxville, Flint, Battle Creek, Myrtle Beach. So you can see that top 25 look up to be a little concentrated in a few states here, but the point is we're going to start seeing these numbers drop. So Morristown, Tennessee, minus 26%, all the way down to Myrtle Beach is minus 18. As I always say, you know, going back to, you know, they're not calling chaos. So they're going to be somewhat conservative. So these numbers will most likely increase as time goes on and or more cities will jump up into those higher levels. So um, he expects the, uh, the housing activity decline to bottom out in the coming months. Who, who does? Its name is Mark Zandi. He's the analytics guy at Moody's. Um, the, the home price appreciate, uh, correction, which started this summer, could take years to play out. This is the thing. So we're going to watch this slowly kind of, you know, die, this market die over the next couple of years. As I always like to remind people that all this is going on with respect to what? Mortgage rates, inventory, price points, all these factors that typically factor into a normal real estate market, normal correction. What they don't even talk about, and, and all these articles never mention, is the foreclosures, okay? The distressed property that's actually starting to come out now. If you looked at some of my videos before, there's going to be three waves of that. It's going to happen. So that's, you know, this this is the correction part. I always say this is the correction. When the foreclosures ramp up, that will force us into the crash position, all right? So uh, ultimately, sellers are willing to sell. If they realize they're not getting the price I could have gotten a few months ago, but it's still higher than I could have gotten three years ago. They feel like they're doing okay, which is great. But still, the buyer has to ante up for this, right? The buyer has to get approved. It has to make sense. It's going to be tougher for people now with respect to inflation and um, job issues and stuff like that in the economy. It's going to make it tougher to qualify. So again, if prices aren't coming down materially with these interest rates still up high or going higher, What's going to happen? The market will still take, it'll, it'll still come down. It'll come down more than to be expected here. So again, we've got the bubbly, frothy markets, et cetera, ongoing home price correction. So ultimately, in the end, um, you know, before home prices began to decline, we were overvalued nationally by about 25%. Uh, now this means home prices will normalize. Affordability will be restored. It's all about affordability. First time buyers are locked out of the market. They simply can't afford the mortgage payments. Trade up buyers won't sell and buy because it doesn't make economic sense. Exactly right. If you can sell today and make some good money on selling your home, if you want to trade up and buy a bigger home or a nicer home, well, guess what? That equity you kind of gained just going off, going into that other house. So you're not really coming ahead uh, with respect to where everything's at. So things have to drop a little bit more or a lot more to make it truly affordable. So again, this is kind of where we're at now. So my point is just basically saying that the words out, you know, we're, there's no no more bubble. The bubble's bursting. 
Now we're into correction mode. So we're in the like the last, you know, we're in the early third stage, you know what I mean, uh, of what's happening right now. We're seeing some markets starting to crash. Foreclosures aren't even here yet. That market's picking up big time. But for those of you who want to know what's actually happening in your own market, go to gethousingdata.com. That's gethousingdata.com. Reason being, you can check out the distressed property listings right in your own backyard. This is my affiliate link with foreclosure.com. So go to gethousingdata.com. You can really check out what's going on in your neck of the woods. This has coverage all over the U.S. So you don't have to be anywhere in particular. You can, you can look anywhere in the U.S. once you have an account. So gethousingdata.com. All right, wrapping things up here, guys. Um, looking for more agents to join my firm in, in, in Florida. Things have really picked up. Okay, we are getting busier and busier. There are more deals that we're uh, involved in now. They've started to peak, which is great. These are all distressed property deals. These are homes facing foreclosure, people who are over leveraged. You wouldn't believe what I've learned. Like I know a lot about this stuff, but you wouldn't believe what I've learned the past one or two months uh, from different perspectives, from what home sellers and, and people in these situations are thinking, what they're being told by their lender, um, all the misinformation about this sort of niche market here. It's, it's ridiculous and the homeowners are getting hurt, but we have ways to help them. All right. So that's the scoop right now. Also, my new program is out now. So my um, we're working forward with the foreclosure fortune. So please get in now. Reach out to me before the masses come. All right. So once again, you want to talk about anything real estate. Um, I've got my hands on some other neat things too. Um, you know, what we'll call them um, like not tapes, but you know, like portfolios. I've got a, a contact of mine who's given me about six different portfolios, everything from, you know, six beautiful Airbnb performing condos in Madeira Beach, Florida to 120 plus single family homes for sale in the Tampa area. They're all performing. So everything in between. So please reach out to me. That's my email. Tell me what you're looking for, how I can help you. And we'll go from there. So once again, everybody, thank you for the views, likes, comments. Please share the video with your family and friends. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. I look forward to speaking with you in a couple of days. See ya.